God's peace to you on this 18th Sunday after Pentecost. Our text this morning is taken from St. John, the ninth chapter. John said to Jesus, Teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he was not following us. But Jesus said, Do not stop him, for no one who does a deed of power in my name will be able soon afterward to speak evil of me. Whoever is not against us is for us. For truly I tell you, whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because you bear the name of Christ will by no means lose the reward. If any of you put a stumbling block before one of these little ones who believe in me, it would be better for you if a great millstone were hung around your neck and you were thrown into the sea. If your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life maimed than to have two hands and go to hell, to the unquenchable fire. And if your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than to have two feet and be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to stumble, tear it out, for it is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into hell, where their worm never dies and the fire is never quenched. For everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if salt has lost its saltiness, how can you season it? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. In the comedy film Monty Python and the Holy Grail, which satirizes the legends of King Arthur. There's a scene, a famous Black Knight combat scene, which is one of the most beloved and quoted of the film. Arthur is refused passage by the Black Knight. And so the king is forced into a duel with long swords. It's not long into the fight before the Black Knight has lost his entire arm at the shoulder but the knight refuses to stop the duel or even to acknowledge his injury. They continue to fight with Arthur whittling off the other arm and eventually both legs. And the knight fights on shouting and taunting the king and threatening even to bite his ankles. Arthur continues on his quest, quest uninjured, declaring, okay, then we'll call it a draw. As he rides on, the Black Knight continues his limbless challenges, a torso with a head, and yet he has the biggest heart ever, lustily crying out for more combat. The Knight's desire for the fight is so great, he does not need his arms and his legs. How did the disciples hear these words of Jesus? If your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life maimed than to have two hands and go uh, to hell, to the unquenchable fire. And if your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than to have two feet to be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to stumble, tear it out, for it is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into hell. Did they actually consider this to be a call to become one-eyed, one-legged, one-armed, mutilated followers of Jesus? The usual way sinful people hear this is actually pretty extreme. Every few years in the media, you will hear some story of someone who has taken this verse, these verses literally with very tragic consequences. But is this what Jesus intends, some sort of self-imposed Sharia law? After all, Sharia law calls for the taking of hands and feet caused in, uh, caught in sin. Jesus seems to be saying, you need to enforce this law upon yourself. Don't wait for the authorities to sentence you. You cut off your own hand or foot. Show your obedience to the law and avoid hell by executing the judgment of the law upon your own body. But if Jesus were establishing some such law, why did he condemn the Lex Talionis in his Sermon on the Mount? 
You have heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist an evildoer. But if anyone strikes you on the right cheek, turn also the other. Of course, when Jesus speaks this way, he is calling us to give up our rights under the law to retaliate. Legally, you may take a hand for a hand, a tooth for a tooth, or an eye for an eye. But Jesus calls his disciples to give up their rights under the law, to not retaliate, but instead forgive. He has called us to offer grace under the law to all people, but then orders us to not show any mercy to our own souls? Forgive the man who sinfully hits you. Do not cut off his hand. But if your hand causes you to sin, you better fire up the bandsaw. And then there's the question of the cause of sin. Can your hand or your eye or your feet cause you to sin? Well, do I get away with that defense in court? Well, officer, I was walking down the razor blade aisle of the drugstore and my hand, all on its own, made the decision to sin and reached out and took those packs of razor blades. I would not have stolen if not for this wayward hand of mine. Jesus said, it is from within, out of a person's heart, that all evil comes. He even listed some of those sins so that we were clear. Fornication, theft, murder, adultery, avarice, wickedness, deceit, licentiousness, envy, slander, pride, folly. All these evil things come from within and they defile a person. Well, there are certainly some body parts that could be cut off related to each of the sins in these lists. But Jesus didn't call for surgery neither of the hand or the foot or the eye. Although if he had called for the removal of the offending heart, he would finally be addressing your sin under the law with the only thing that can pay for sin, life. The law would finally accomplish its task of killing the sinner for his sin. It would be better if you lost everything, all of the causes of sin in your life, Jesus has been describing how that could be accomplished for over a chapter, and yet his disciples still do not understand. Eliminating sin is not accomplished with the works of your hands. You cannot walk far enough to escape it. Your eyes are too easily distracted and all too limited to see your way to righteousness. So eliminate these works of your hands and feet and eyes. You can do nothing with all of your body parts to rid yourself of sin. Address the true problem. Whose heart beats in your chest? If it is your own, why do you need Jesus? You apparently already have found a way to avoid all the sin that Jesus declares came from your heart. Since your eyes do not see evil and your feet do not walk in the way of sinners, then apparently you have no need of Jesus nor his Father. Of course, only fools talk like this, as if sacrificing their hand or even keeping it, doing the proper works or sinful works, was anything more than a manifestation of whose heart beats in their chest. The gospel does not say the Son of Man rose in order for you to work your way into God's good graces. He died and rose again to strip you of your sin. He didn't ask your permission, nor did he seek your approval. Being God, he's kind of sometimes rude like that. Those who love me will keep my word, and my Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words, and the word that you hear is not mine, but is from the Father who sent me. 
keep holding on to Christ's words. His word is his bond. His word called you into existence. His word declared you a righteous child of the Father. His word called all of creation into existence and the dead from their graves. Hold fast to that word. Grasp it. And claim the promises of it because it is the word of Christ that keeps evil from the heart of men. His love and righteousness drives out and conquers those dark words in our heart that would rather hold on to the law, even if that law requires us to mutilate ourselves. Our word is the word of Christ, spoken over our sin-trapped hands, feet, and eyes. His word has spoken his promise to us that the work of his hands and eyes and heart have been imputed to us, given freely to keep us freely and safely, from the power of sin, death, and the devil. Amen.